welcome to the HCR Digital Asset Group podcast series, where we interview thought leaders in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Today, we are very excited to have James Brennan, Director of Disputes and Investigations Practice at Duff & Phelps, a global valuation and corporate finance advisor. Thank you, James, for joining us today. Good morning. James, to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the crypto space? Sure. Well, personally, I got into the space about last year. Um, I had a lot of friends that were in the space, and I kind of, you know, wanted to be, wanted to be involved and had that, you know, that similar, you know, human uh, feeling of fear of missing out. But I think I probably got in a little bit earlier than most people, so I was I was kind of lucky, and I, you know, didn't lose my shirt in in uh, January when it started to fall. But also professionally, um, I was around the same time I was doing um, hedge fund audits and reviews. Um, banking and regulatory compliance work, um, both in the U.S. and abroad, and we realized that there was going to be a niche for this um, related to crypto hedge funds, um, exchanges, and the like. So we kind of pivoted, and we did our research, and we realized that, you know, this was one of the, the big issues that was plaguing um, these, these sorts of startups. I think you'll find that as more and more institutions are moving into this space, some of the issues you're investigating into will be very relevant. I want to dive a bit deeper into your work. Forensic accounting is often about finding financial fraud. In many AML research reports, blockchain always comes up as a recurring technology that can be used to solve accounting issues. How do you see blockchain changing the forensic accounting landscape? So I guess, Taking a step back, well, first, uh, you know, I think it's definitely going to it's going to change the world at some point. But I think taking a step back is, you know, there's a couple of barriers to entry for blockchain. I think the first barrier is the scalability of the blockchain. Um, I think it, it, you know, while it sounds like a great idea, we still it still needs to be implemented, tested, tried, um, and su- successfully input into these these various companies and and systems and products. Um, I, I think the other issue with it is related to the cost that 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 comes with it in trying to implement it and to test it and to do all the things that I just mentioned. Um, and then once you're able to do all this, you know, it, it's never about no one ever wants to be the first one to anything because usually the first one to it, well, you're waiting around for everyone else to catch up to it. So it, you know, I, I think the best thing for blockchain is if it goes at a pace where everyone's kind of along the same. Um, or run, running along with each other, so that when they figure it out, you know they'll all be able to to make best use of it. And then, as far as well, using blockchain to enhance the accounting profession, being an accountant, you're essentially you know using ledgers to track transactions, um, to to you know essentially keep records, um, and that is exactly what blockchain is in and of itself. It's a huge ledger, and um, I mean, from that perspective, um, being an accountant, it, it should really make things more accurate and more efficient. I recently read some articles about how accountants will still be very important for many years to come, and the same can be said for lawyers as well. However, some thought leaders in this space think that accountants and lawyers may need to develop new skill sets, perhaps auditing code and learning programming. What do you think are some of the most important skill sets that someone needs going forward if they want to work, let's say, in the Duff and Phelps disputes and investigations practice? If I had kids around the age of, you know, going into high school or college, I would definitely push them to, you know, take some sort of um, um, computer programming language, well, whatever it may be, so that they understand um, the bare minimum of, of how things are working, how things are inter- interacting, because that's the day, uh, you know, the day and age that we're living in at this at this point in time. Um, but as far as um, you know, currently, if someone's interviewing at at, at Duff and Phelps or or any other accounting firm for for that matter, I think you know, and and it's kind of cliche to say, but um, having great communication skills is is something that's truly important. And when I say great communication skills, I don't mean you know. Being able to to talk to your 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 peers or or clients and whatnot, but being able to understand um, and interact with the technologists and the engineers, and being able to apply and interpret 
what they're seeing and what they're finding or even what they're saying into what you're doing. So how does how does you know some of the analysis that they're actually that they're actually conducting with some of this big data, how does that go into what you're trying to, whether it's investigate or review, how does that apply? Um, and I think that's the that's one of the biggest issues that people have is there's there it's hard there's there's really no middleman, if you will, to to communicate between the accountant and then and the technologist. So I think that that really helps everybody in in the industry. Soft skills such as the ones you mentioned are certainly making a comeback. Given the dynamic business climate that we are currently in, employers will want to future-proof their workforce by investing in people with the core soft skills necessary to adapt to change and become resilient during times of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You have worked on numerous high-profile engagements. Were there any experiences from these engagements that helped convince you that blockchain was a revolutionary technological development? Um, you know, funny you ask that, but there, there certainly was. Um, I worked on the Madoff investigation um, back in, I guess it was when it started, in, in late 2008, early 2009, and I worked on it for about four to five years um, while I was at another consulting firm. Um, we had been hired by, uh, by uh, SIPC, government agency, um, that insures um, a lot of these funds. And um, one of the, the big things that, that blockchain would have been able to help with would be to track the transactions and their history, as well as you know come to some sort of consensus that these transactions were valid and that they were actually taking place. So if we had that, there would have been no fraud by Bernie Madoff committed because, be, because he wouldn't have been able to do it because it was so centralized. It was centralized to the point that him and only one or two other people knew what was going on and, and knew what they were doing, that you know blockchain would not allow for that. Um, I think it's also important for people to understand, you know, what I was kind of talking about earlier, that, you know, there's always going to be this need for, for um, interpretation of, of what you're seeing and what you're finding. Um, so, you know, when working on some of these high profile cases, being able to, to utilize various tools and, and software and systems um, to, to, to help find some of this, this fraudulent activity you know, is only as good as the users that are that are actually applying it. Many people these days say that Bitcoin and other crypto, maybe with the exception of privacy coins, are actually very traceable. For example, they're able to shut down the Silk Road criminal website. I've heard that some lawmakers in D.C. would prefer criminals use crypto over fiat because the latter is much harder to trace and easier to launder. What are your thoughts on this? Um, correct. Um, we've had a couple of cases where we were actually able to trace the theft of, of Bitcoin um, overseas, and we actually were able to trace it to the end user um, and actually get those funds back. Um, so from that perspective, yes, it's, it's, it's somewhat easier, easy, more easily traced. Um, however, I think it comes down to you know just criminality in general. Um, you know if, if these people, criminals who, you know, whoever they are, are, are going to put so much effort and, and, and time into stealing something, they're probably going to steal it. So whether it's crypto, whether it's fiat, no matter what it is, you know, at some point in time, they're going to be able to break whatever security procedures or, and, and parameters that we have in place. But it, it's, you know, us unfortunately keeping up with them and trying to stay a little bit ahead of them so that it, it, it is that much more difficult for them to do it. We're never going to, we're never going to be able to stop it all, but we'll try to do our best to at least slow it. Why do you think many people still associate crypto with stigma? Some of the common criticisms I'm sure you know, are that it is a scam. It has no inherent value and that it only is valuable for criminals. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it comes down to, to the education of, of things in the world. Um, but, you know, as humans, I think when we encounter, whether it's, you know, a new activity or, or just anything new, we're kind of a little bit hesitant to, to accept it until we really understand and see the advantages that, that it actually will provide, provide us. Um, I think the surge in pricing with Bitcoin um, kind of helped 
a lot more people see Bitcoin um, and, and as well as blockchain. And I and I never liked to to, to um, you know talk about Bitcoin and blockchain as, as one and the same because they're they're very very different. Um, but but in this instance, I will. I think um, with the price going up as high as it did, you had you know grandfathers to Wall Street gurus, you know, jumping off for the ride because they they didn't want to miss out. Similar to how I got into the into the into the space uh, personally, they didn't want to miss out. Um, and and through that, they they began to educate themselves. So I think there's a lot more acceptance um, later. You know, uh, you know, as we sit here today, than there was, you know, six or seven months ago, and I and I think, you know, as as, as I've heard other people say, you know, speculation drives innovation, and it's no different here. Um, many people are 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 you know out there trying to make money, and if they want to do that, they're going to need to educate themselves, and this is just another way that that can go go about doing it. But I think education is, is certainly the key. Which regulatory agencies do you think will have more authority in determining how crypto assets are regulated? The CFTC or the SEC? So I think right now, um, and, and probably it's, it's one of the first times that, that you have regulatory bodies or agencies um, really working together to try and understand you know, what this asset class is. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, you know, I feel that the, the SEC, um, they, they may be a little bit more further along um, than, than everyone else. Um, but, you know, no matter how far along they are, they still need to educate themselves. And that, that's, what they're, that, that's what they're using this, this, this time now. And this is why, you know, a couple of months ago, they sent her out those, around those requests for information because they're trying to figure out, you know, who the players in the space are. Who are the bad eggs in this space? Who are the people that are reliable and, and actually advising some of these these um, crypto funds and exchanges correctly? So you know, I, I think it's going to take a while, but you'll see in the, you know the next you know six months to a year that the SEC is 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 really going to come out you know understanding it and, and and really clamp down with some some um, decisions. And what do you think will be the impact of some of these regulations? So I, I think I think in this space, and, and a lot of people will tell you that the regulation will be good. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of money that's in crypto right now, but none of it's institutional. So when there is some sort of regulation, and there's there have been some sort of decisions made, whether it's SEC, CFTC, IRS, um, at the state level even. Um, you're going to start to see the institutional money from, you know, big banks coming in. And that's that's the game changer. You know, if people thought there was a lot of money in it, in it you know, today, it's nothing until, uh, you know, in, until institutional investors get in. So I think the regulation will be good for everyone. Right. And at HCR, we often discuss this notion that once institutional money or smart money comes in, the market cap of some of these coins could grow significantly. Anthony Pompliano recently wrote that Bitcoin non-believers are like kids who haven't been told Santa isn't real yet. They believe in a fairy tale and are incentivized not to investigate the truth. What do you think about this quote? To me, you know, everyone has their own opinion. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, it, it's or go down the rabbit hole of get, getting into the argument versus U.S. dollar versus crypto or vice versa, because um, everyone's going to have their own differing beliefs. But I think those differing beliefs keep everyone in check. Um, I think right now there are there are more non-believers than believers, but you know I think that tide is changing, um, and the tides will really change at the point when, like I just mentioned, you know the institutional money comes into the picture um, through or because of some of the regulation that's out there. Um, you know, as people say, it's it's just the beginning. It's the second or the third inning, um, and, and it's exciting to to be a part of something that early in the game. There is an ongoing debate with Bitcoin. Some say that the real value of Bitcoin comes from its underlying technology, which is blockchain. Yet others believe that the value of Bitcoin is its ability to enable trust without the need for third parties. And I would say that given Bitcoin's resilience, regulators will certainly have a hard time controlling this digital asset. 
Absolutely, and I, and I think it all comes comes back to um, the education of things. You know, things are things are are, are so new in the space. You know, you could say that, or I guess the argument could be made that it's you know around since 2000, 2008, 2009. But really, I mean, it's still not even mainstream at this point. Um, even you know, I was I was traveling. I was out in um, on the West Coast a, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, you would think that is the mecca of of you know, crypto and technology. And there's a lot of people that just don't really know about it. Um, whether, whether it's because they're too busy in their lives um, or, or whatever it is, but people just haven't taken the time to, to, to take a step back and really, really get into it or, or, or really peel the layers apart and understand it. That's a good point. At HCR, we understand that the space is very speculative. So we try to take a rigorous due diligence approach lasting from weeks to months, looking at the technology and meeting with the founding team with the hope of bringing some legitimacy to a relatively messy space. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important point to, to make. Um, even from a, a um, perspective, or from my perspective, as you know, when we take on new clients even, um, I think one of the big things that, that we're concerned with is, you know, do we want to take on the risk of advising someone that, that may be one of these bad actors in the space. So I think that people need to really do their own due diligence. And that's one of the things that, you know, we do on an everyday basis for all of our clients, um, whether it's, you know, private equity clients, hedge fund clients, you need to understand who you're dealing with because you don't, you know, I think there's one, you know, you have one shot at this, you know, and, and especially the world that we live in, you know, if you do something or, or get in bed with the wrong people, Everyone else is going to know about it, and that's the last thing that you want to do. James, before I let you go today, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Yes, I, I think, you know, as we were discussing earlier, one of the things that we're really helping um, our clients with these days, is, is, and, and I think, you know, the climate, climate is really changing. Um, and, I'll, uh, and I'll kind of take a step back and take us back to probably October, November, where we had people that were out there that were trying to make a quick buck. And I think these past, you know, four or five months, we've seen a lot of those bad actors um, kind of give way to people that really understand and really have a plan of what they want to do. And you're starting to see some, some you know, people that are, that are backed by legitimate VCs or, or legitimate families that are getting into the space and they want to do this correctly. Um, and so that's one of, the, one of the things that we really, you know, advise our clients to do is, is be prepared to, to set up the company um, with the proper infrastructure, infrastructure from the get-go um, because it, it's, it's so much harder to, to go back after something goes wrong. So, you know, starting things correctly from the get-go will really enable you to succeed and be successful down the road, years down the road. Um, because it's one thing to hire us to advise you as you're setting up the company, but it's another thing to to hire us to help investigate what happened when something went wrong, or even further down the line to hire us to to restructure or or um, you know file bankruptcy for you. So I, I I you know like to start at the beginning of of the of the company life cycle, you know, you know, and, and reiterate that it's important to do things correctly up front rather than, you know, save some, a, a couple of dollars um, and, and wait till something bad happens. That's very good advice. Thank you, James, for joining our podcast and sharing your thoughts about blockchain's impact on forensic accounting, as well as the state of regulation for crypto. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was great being on.